like to uh, call to order a meeting of the Sunderland Elementary School Committee uh, Wednesday, January 26th at uh, 5.30 p.m. Um, and this is really a special purpose meeting. Uh, it's to talk about the new guidance from DESE uh, with regard to, uh, well, the entire new guidance from DESE regarding uh, COVID uh, and uh, also to have public comment and discussion decide whether uh, there are any actions to be taken, uh, the issues of policy to be cited by uh, school committee. Um, and uh, let's start with uh, public comment. Let's see. Uh, all right. Vicki Palmer has a hand up. We want to start there. Vicki, are you on mute? All right, well, uh, why don't we, while we're trying to figure that out, how about uh, Jill Dickinson? Are you available to make your public comment? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Oh, okay, perfect. Okay. Um, I am really hoping that the committee votes to adopt these new COVID guidelines uh, pretty much for one reason, because it will end the discriminatory contact tracing that you guys are currently doing. Um, I'm sure at this point, everyone has realized that there is no difference uh, between vaccinated and unvaccinated when it comes to infection and transmission. Um, so I just don't understand why the only the unvaccinated kids are being sent home. Um, let's see what else that I have. I mean, I know your hands are tied because it, you've had to follow the DESI guidelines, but this is your chance to change it and make the it more equitable. So that's pretty much all I had to say about that. Thank you. That's that it's very discriminatory. But yeah, that's it. All right. Allison Booth. Yes, hi. Um my name's Allison Booth Mayo and I'm an SES parent. Uh I'm here tonight in support of transitioning to uh, the new at-home testing program that's recommended by DESE, which involves ceasing contact tracing and the test and stay program. Under the current arrangement, some kids are caught in a continual testing loop, pool testing each week with a follow-up test if the pool is positive, test and stay for five days after being in close contact, then another test and stay sentence after the next close contact. In my experience, it's even possible to be tested twice in one day if more than one testing protocol applies. It's really out of control. One of the main reasons I support the change that's under consideration is that it represents one small step towards eliminating over overly onerous and unnecessary protocols. I imagine that the burden of the current protocols on the school and on the nursing staff in particular is tremendous between contact tracing communications to parents of close contact status and testing close contacts, in addition to duties related to all the other testing programs. And for what? The evidence, including data from our state government, has consistently shown that in-school transmission is rare. I note that all the other schools in the district are transitioning to the new at-home testing program. Sunderland should follow suit. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Vicki, can we try again? Yes, let's try again. Thanks everyone for your patience. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all the members of the Sunderland School Committee who work with us to ensure consistent, clear health and safety protocols remain at the forefront of our entire community. My name is Victoria Palmer and I speak with you tonight as co-president 
of the Union 38 Educators Association, the school's psychologist and counselor, head teacher, and 19 year veteran of serving the wonderful Sunderland community. Tonight, I'm going to speak on behalf of specifically my Sunderland community. <clears throat> Our always masked members continue to work tirelessly to support students with creative instruction, flexible lessons, and maintaining standards of health and safety during this extremely challenging time. I speak on behalf of many of our members as I ask you to recognize how the timing of this switch away from contact tracing feels precipitous, particularly within a diverse community like Sunderland. Our members are nervous and scared about these proposed changes to our current system of procedural safeguards surrounding contact tracing, which we know helps slow the spread and helps provide an additional layer of security and communication. We know the virus transmission is rampant and we see the spread within our community, even with our current mitigation measures in place. Close contacts are everywhere within our community. And that also means it is the health, safety, and well being of teachers who need to be present, stay healthy, and be closely engaged with students. On any given day, teachers hear students talk about gathering together outside of school, even when there are positive cases surrounding them or even when they have tested COVID positive. Those same students come to school asymptomatic, yet sometimes test positive, and the cycle continues. Teachers are faced with the ethical dilemma of not sharing information about COVID positive cases in their classrooms when receiving inquiries from concerned families, even when they are aware of the close proximity and the resulting spread. Contact tracing is one more safety net that keeps us engaged and represents how the community cares about its teachers and students. Let's help our school to stay open by carefully considering these recommended DESE guidelines that eliminate contact tracing and relies on a system that is less manageable and transparent. Please keep contact tracing measures in place in order to keep our school open, our students, faculty, and staff safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so here's where we're at. Other schools in the district have decided to let this be a matter of procedure for the administration and the staff, health staff uh, and local health officials to decide and not an issue of policy for the school board to get involved in. Um, there's no uh, different towns across the state, though, have taken uh, different stances on this uh, in order for us to uh change something or tell the school we want to change something it it seems to me we would have to create uh, a policy and figure out what that says um and sometimes having a motion on the floor helps to focus discussion i don't know if anyone wants to make a motion or do we want to just open it up to general discussion uh with between the members and uh, the administration and the health staff that are here now i'm willing to make a motion Okay. To open discussion, uh, I move that we adopt the new DESE protocol uh, with distribution of rapid tests for use at home, um, but with one modification, which would be to continue contact tracing for the sole purpose of close contact notifications, not test and stay, just the close contact notifications, until we can get a report from administration on the um, the recent numbers of 
close contacts who are testing positive as compared to the general school population. This is because uh, we are now in the Omicron wave and we don't know whether Omicron is transmissible in school the way previous var variants have not been particularly transmissible with our mitigations. Is that clear? That was long, sorry. That was, yeah, that was uh, a mouthful. Uh, no, and I, I, I get it. I, I kind of see where you're going with that, um, I think. Um, Could you George, go ahead, Peter. To get clear, so that I have, I got to take the minutes here. Um, what I've got is, a, is the, the motion is to adopt the new DESI plan, uh, in plus uh, close contact tracing, uh, pending a report from the administration that, and then I sort of got lost. A report from the administration on the comparison of close contacts testing positive compared to the general school population. On the the number of close contacts testing positive compared to the general school population. Thank you. And if anybody else would second that, I would explain more about where I'm coming from. Um, I'll second that. You all want me to jump right. into my right. rationale? Go, go ahead. Let's hear it. Okay, thanks. Um, so, all right, I've explained where I'd like to head with this. I would like us to continue the contact tracing for the purposes of close contact uh, notifications until we know more about how Omicron is behaving in schools. Uh, I'm gonna, oh, I hope it's set up. I would like to share my, my screen um, to show you just where we are historically in this, um, in the pandemic. Can you see my screen? I, yep. Yes, okay, thank you. All right, so I wanted to show you how Massachusetts and Franklin County COVID rates have compared to each other over time. Um, the best way for me to do that was using my own spreadsheet. I have been tracking since uh, September of uh, 2020. That's how far back this goes. This is not the, the very first days of the pandemic. Um, So here it's just some of the contours. You can see that Franklin County in red um, has generally had lower rates than, than Massachusetts has statewide. Um, and the reason I want to show this to you is that back uh, last you know, December, January, we spent a lot of time fully remote. Um, it was pre-vaccinations for, for the general population. Um, when, our, when we thought we were in the, what would be the worst part of the pandemic, um, but compared to where we are now, so this section over here on the right, um, our recent history where we are now, um, this is where Omicron has 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 reached our our area. Um, so comparing our previous all time high of COVID rates um, before Omicron to our Omicron peak, those are peaks labeled there. Um, Massachusetts. Uh, rates got about four times higher at the peak than they did previously. And Franklin County, we're more than, we got more than five and a half times higher than we had ever been prior to Omicron. And this is updated. Um, this one is a few days old. This is zoomed in from uh, November to today. This is including today's numbers um, from the Department of Public Health on the daily dashboard, 14 day average. Um, we happen to, Franklin County happens to have a slightly higher average right now than Massachusetts. I, don't know why, I don't think it's significant, but my point here is that our rates are still extremely high and that Omicron is like nothing we've ever dealt with before. So when we say that transmissions have not been happening in school, we don't really know that yet about Omicron. This is just a completely different, a different animal. So um, I wanted us to understand that. Um, the reason I'd like us to continue doing the close contact notifications until we know more 
Um, I want to acknowledge that close contact notifications, con con contact tracing for that purpose, doesn't prevent any transmissions inside school. Um, by the time you're doing contact tracing, the exposure has already happened. But what it does is that it empowers families to make safe decisions outside of school when they're when they have been exposed. Um, if we could, uh, well, let me back up. My family received a close contact notification earlier this month. Um, we had plans to see to have contact with some other households, and we told them. You know, one of my one of our kids was contact traced from school, and both of them said, "Hey, you know what?" Let's just wait. Let's not get together. That's a reason to not do it. We'll just wait a week, you know, to see the grandparents who are in their 70s, who are, you know, an at-risk group. Um, I also spoke the other day with a, a neighbor, a slightly different situation, but um, part of their family actually caught COVID and they decided in order to protect another part of the family, the healthy members went to stay at another house. Um, so there are ways that families who get these close contact notifications can use that information to prevent further spread outside of school. Um, so I'd like to like us to continue doing those contact those close contact notifications until we can find out what is happening with Omicron in our school and in our district. Um, what I'm picturing, and I would like to hear some discussion of what this could look like, um, but I'm picturing having a careful analysis of, um, you know, how many close contacts we've had, um, how many of them tested positive within 10 days within that theoretical window, and how that compares to the overall school population. Um, Desi proposed this new model um, before we really knew anything about how Omicron was behaving in our schools, whether it is transmissible in the schools. Um, they did it in part in response to lots of feedback um, that the contact tracing was impossible to keep up with, particularly in larger schools, particularly where students um, and teachers change their, their classroom or their grouping, you know, five, six, seven, eight times a day. That contact tracing, there are lots of schools that were simply literally not able to keep up. That has not been our situation here in Sunderland. Uh, we get the school committee gets great reports from Ben um, on a near daily basis that there have been new positives and contact tracing has been completed. Um, if this report could be uh, supplied for our next meeting, that's next Tuesday. Um, we're scheduled to begin the new protocols on Monday. So, if the if we could get that information for next Tuesday, I'm only asking for two extra days of contact tracing and close contact notifications. I think that's basically what I wanted to spell out. If there's more, I'd be happy to discuss, but motion is on the floor. <laughs> Any other committee member thoughts? Go ahead, Peter. Well, I just obviously would like to hear what uh, uh, the administration, and particularly uh, Meg Birch, who is our nurse leader, um, how she feels about the, the situation in general. This in both, I mean, this particular motion, but also the situation in general. Meg, can you respond? Yeah, I was sorry. I was I was doing some quick counting. I had done some worked on some calculations earlier, but not specific to what Jessica was ask, is asking for. So I was just trying to give rough some rough numbers to her question but um i'll go back to that um we're we're really finding that the the that really the, the landscape has changed um most of the public health districts in this area public health nurses and uh districts are are not actively contact tracing um they are notifying cases they uh the the FERCOG district at this point uh, sends a message to to a positive case um, with a link to the information and contact uh, information for somebody who has questions um, about what they need to do as a as a positive COVID case. Um, if they talk to somebody and they're aware of close contacts, they do provide guidance to that, but they're not actively contact tracing. Um, one of the towns in our district, the public health nurse is less busy than some of the other districts. And when they are able to, they are actively contact tracing. Um, in Sunderland, and Caitlin, you can speak to this more. I think once the CTC 
stood down. Uh, they took their last cases November 30th. Um, there's been a gap with the, the grant that the Greenfield, Montague, Sunderland, and Deerfield got to hire a public health nurse. That person, I believe, is just onboarding now. Um, they, they introduced themselves to me last week in a phone call. And at that point, we're waiting for their Maven access. And Caitlin, you, you know more about that. But I think there's been, um, that's created a gap in some of the community contact tracing for, for, for Sunderland. But a lot of the students in the school don't, you know, they come from other communities and a lot of the staff come from other communities. So there's not the kind of robust contact tracing that we had uh, going, you know, earlier in the pandemic. Um, Caitlin, I saw you unmuted. Do you want to comment before I go on? I, I didn't know if you needed me to. Um, we made ourselves fully available. Um, yes, we, there was a, a gap, but we were in contact with uh, Nurse Sam. And um, our public health nurse was, is also uh, the Montague public health nurse. And so I did instruct her to, um, if there was a family, like we did have a family in Sunderland Elementary School who is from Montague. And so I kind of ran point and the entire family has had COVID at this point, <laughs> lots of kids. Um, and I told them to, you know, make the phone calls, do the contact tracing. I spoke with the nurse. I spoke with the public health nurse. Um, I have always, my problem is I started in August a new full-time job. Um, so last year I was much more available um, than I am this year to be point contact person because um, this is a volunteer job for me. And, um, you know, now that we have the new person, she is starting tomorrow. And we also have an epidemiologist uh, starting. And the uh, all of the contact information for the Sunderland nurse uh, public, excuse me, the Sunderland Elementary nurse has uh, been sent to uh, Mary Ellen, who is the new public health nurse. And on my instruction, she will be uh, doing any any contact tracing, any help, anything that the SAM needs. Can, can you clarify, though, is, is the community contact tracing going to be reactivated? Yes, because absolutely, 100%. So aside, from the, aside from the school? Yes. Okay, so that would I'm be I'm here useful. at the Board of Health. I mean, excuse me, the Board of Health. Oh, I don't know where I am. I'm okay. here at the school board meeting because I was just, re you know, here to uh, let you know that I'm I'm not going I'm not necessarily taking a position on whether you should contact trace or not. I am telling you that it will be available to you um, and that I will uh, I will make that available to you and if it is not working properly, I expect a phone call directly to me and I will make it work properly. And I will make, if you see a problem, if you see an issue, I will make that issue go away. We have the funding. I will get the funding. I've been told by my town administrator, he will get me the funding. Okay. Uh, because the health and safety of the community is important. Um, it's my mission as, as Board of Health. Um, I think that the school has been doing a great job. Um, and I will back, I think that you guys are working together very well, and I think maybe a hybrid approach might be best, but I honestly am not going to weigh in because um, the administrative costs and duties, yeah. it all needs to be taken into account. Okay, so... Um it's thanks for it was additional information I didn't have and uh, a greater scope of, of work than what was explained to me by the, by, by um, Mary Ellen Sloan. So, um, but to go back to the question about where I stand on the contact tracing within the school, I mean, I think, I think one thing I want to be really clear about is that the new program 
um, where we can distribute tests for families to do um, surveillance testing um, on Thursdays is the day that's been chosen. It does not allow us to continue uh, the contact tracing. You either stay with test and stay in contact tracing or you do the new program. Um, so that that's the way that it has been set up by DESI. And I did specifically ask about that. Um, it's not, I, I don't support continued contact tracing in the school. Um, we did meet with the nursing team. Darius and I met with the nursing team to get their feedback. Um, I had looked at our data on test and stay in the district. Uh, out of the, actually, I, re, I redid the numbers. Out of 1,148 test and stays done this school year, there were four that were positive. One of those was revoked by a PCR the same day. Um, that's like a third of a percent um, for all of those tests. And none of those tests and stays happened to be Sunderland. Um, it's an enormous amount of work. It is taking the nurses away from their other responsibilities as a, as a professional school nurse. Um, we're way behind on screenings this year in, in most of the buildings. Um, we did not do screenings last uh, year. So for some of these kids, they've not been screened in school. Some kids have not been screened in school since the fall of 2019. Um, and not all screenings, uh, actually, I think 2019, the screenings were all done, but not last year and we're behind this year. Um, there's a lot that school nurses do to support kids to be able to be in school and to be learning. Um, I, I don't see what we're doing now as making the building safer. Um, out of, there's about 39, 40 cases that we've had in December and January for Sunderland Elementary. Um, less than half of those, I mean, 19 out of the 40 were identified through a pool test or a symptomatic test. The others were reported to us by families, mostly home tests, and those are not reported to the town. They're not reported to the state of Massachusetts um, to show up in, um, in the MAVEN uh, tracking system. Those are families reporting um, you know, to SAM that uh, a child tested positive. Um, most of the exposures that we know about are still outside of the school. Um, some of the close contacts we have or some of the cases we have when I was looking at the dates and I don't, I didn't, I haven't tallied the numbers. I'm happy to do that as, as the discussion continues, um, to give rough numbers. They won't be specifically what Jessica is asking for, um, you know, in this kind of format, but, um, a lot of our, when I look at, you know, oh, this person was a close contact and a case. Oh, well, they were a cl close contact two weeks after they were a case. Or they were a close contact more than, I was using 14 days, uh, more than 14 days. Um, there are very, and, and again, I don't have, I didn't do the final tally. Um, but of the, it's roughly 180 people on the list of close contacts for December and January. Um, and the 39 cases. And what I don't have and can't give you is how many of those, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm hesitating because I don't know that I can give you how many of those were absolutely with certainty where that transmission happened. Many of those we know it happened outside of school. Um, kids are, families are, getting together outside of school. And I think as, you know, once the pediatric uh, vaccination became available and families took advantage of that, uh, Sunderland, when I last was looking at vaccination numbers, trying to update them, um, they had the highest uh, vaccination rate among the elementary schools. They were right around 70% had any dose of the students. Um, and uh, so people understandably and appropriately are you know, they're looking at their situation, they're assessing the risks for their family, and they're 
they're doing different things. And kids socializing outside of school, we know is critical for their well-being, for their mental health, for their overall health. Um, and so with, with that change and with Omicron, yeah, we, we all saw um, an uptick in cases. Those cases are already coming down. Our pools, uh, positive pools in the district this week are lower than the last two weeks. Um, and our case numbers are starting to come down as well across the district. Um, I'm going to stop there because I feel like I've been talking for a long time and I don't want to hog the floor. Could I just ask you a question, Meg? Yeah. Because it's probably easier because they're adults, easier to kind of grasp and they're not bopping around too much. Do we know, do we have any type of statistics or even uh, anecdotal evidence about transmission to adults in the school? Um, that they've transmitted through school contact, uh, teachers, staff members? Um, nothing that's certain, I guess is how I would say it. I know we had um, adults uh, test positive when there were also positives uh, within that classroom. Um, I know that we have had adults positive who shared with me that their exposure was outside of school where they had recently traveled. You, ha you know, we rem remember that, you know, our huge uptick in cases happened it, right after vacation. Right around Christmas, yeah. So, That's you know, topic. we would have expected an uptick with, with you know, holiday travel and gatherings and, um, and okay. such. Um, okay. I just thought that might be a, a, a group more, we have a little bit more handle on, but you're right. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? From committee members, no. I have to unmute. Um, so we've heard uh, about the the spike in cases, which uh, I, I think projections are showing a sharp decline. And I'm, I'm certainly uh, let me clarify where I'm at. Uh, I'm not looking to say whether contact tracing should continue or discontinue, but uh, rather trying to figure out. Uh, if this should be left to the administration and health staff and health officials or whether the school committee has a role to step in and say, uh, we really want to uh, uh, suggest a particular course of action. Um, I remember Trevor McDaniels back, uh, you know, Jessica, you're showing uh, the sort of the spike a year ago that uh, seemed a disaster at the time, but is a small in terms of pure numbers uh, relative to the current situation. Current situation is a little different. Uh, we do have, uh, it's a different strain. More people are vaccinated. Uh, but I remember Trevor saying, oh, you know, the contract tracing, we're, we're up till midnight, but we got it done. And I remember thinking at the time, uh, these things do scale logarithmically when there's when there's big outbreak. Uh, and wondering to what extent the ability to do this kind of work could get overrun by a spike kind of like the one we're seeing now. Um, and it sounds like there's, uh, uh, certainly willingness to do, uh, contact tracing when it's, uh, when it makes sense to the people in the medical community. I know certainly on the front end of an outbreak, it's really important to contain, uh, the, uh, you know, it, when you're trying to contain the initial outbreak, that's a tool when we're at the peak of a spike. I know I've got a daughter who received uh, close contact. Uh, we have someone in the home who's uh, medically sensitive. So she ended up uh, having meals in her room and wearing, you know, we would wear masks around each other. Uh, and then a couple of days after she took her mask off, we got another one. And then another close contact the day after that and, and pretty much came to the conclusion. Uh, it's just, it's run rampant through the schools. If you've got a kid in the schools, more or less assume that they're likely to be in close contact with someone. Um, but I'm, you know, again, as I'm trying to understand the cost benefit stuff, I'm hearing from uh, both the, the commitment to do the work when it's doable and also uh, the extent to which sometimes it may be not necessarily work worth the incremental effort. Um, 
I'm also sort of intrigued by the question you asked, and hopefully there's a, a stats professor somewhere in the uh, in the audience. Uh, it sounds like the thing you're talking about is maybe a one-tailed t-test, where the the right thing to do ahead of time would be to say, uh, you know, we have a null hypothesis that people who are close contacts are getting it at a certain percent higher rate than uh, than the general population. And then you usually pick a p-value, uh, like typically one five ten percent for the um, you know the confidence on that. Um, you know that, that's the sort of thing that you, you try to do ahead of when you actually look at the data, so you know which way it's going to go. And but just thinking that through from sort of a, a methodological point of view, uh, it also runs the risk that you could have correlations, so that there. Are, you know, if kids hang out together, and that that means they would also be close contacts. But if there's other background things that they have in common, that may also uh, mean that one is more likely uh, than the general population to pop positive, even though it wasn't an in-school transmission. Um, so it's a it's a pretty fraught math problem. Um, that's kind of where I'm at. I don't know. If I see Meg nodding. I don't know if she wants to. <laughs> um, it, it is because I think, you know, one of the things I'm seeing is, you know, where, where there's close contacts, um, you know, the, some, in some instances, are, they're, they're close contacts outside of school as well as in school. So how do you apportion the, the, the risk there? Or how do you say this case is due to school versus this case is due to a rec activity or other kind of social, um, social activities? Um, my quick count, and this is a quick count, um, you know, is is that of the 39, 40 cases, um, four were within, there was the close contact was within two weeks. I used 14 days. So I don't, some of those are going to drop off um, because they were 12 days or um, 11 days. Um, so, I, and, I, and I will look at those numbers again. So, you know, but that's just sort of a quick going down the list and trying to do the math um, as, as I'm listening. The other thing I just want to add, and I, Caitlin, I don't know if you were on the board of health, local board of health call yesterday with the state. Um, but um, Katie Brown, the state epidemiologist, was answering questions from local boards of health about the change in the school, this, this new testing option, as, as well as in light of the recommendation from DPH that most communities don't um, continue to do the level of contact tracing that they were doing. And one of the points that she made was that we're really in a different stage of the pandemic, even with Omicron, um, than we were in, you know, uh, two years ago. Uh, well, two years ago, we weren't quite in it. We were, um, <laughs> we, we, some of us maybe knew it was coming, but most of us, you know, most, most of us didn't. Um, but we're just, we really are in a different phase and we're not trying to identify every single case. We're not trying to identify every single, and I say we, and I'm thinking in terms of the public health community. Um, I think that the mitigation measures we have, we know work. We know that masking in school is effective. There's new research out this week um, that supports that. Um, we know that the physical distancing, you know, makes a difference. Um, and, and that and education is going to is at this point, I think, going to gain us gain us more as well as as families having the option to do a, an additional surveillance test, regardless of vaccination status and regardless of a decision to participate in the testing program, which I also think is important because I know there are some families that opted not to do the testing program for various reasons. Um, and they've, they've, they're not eligible for, for the test and stay. Um, they do get contact traced. Um, but this is open to anybody who opts in, um, which is much, you know, which in, in some, in, in some ways is more equitable. Um, Darius, I'm going to cede to you cause I'm. Yeah, thanks. I, my concern. So I, I understand the idea that um, if you are considered a close contact, uh, you will maybe take, you may make different choices based on that information. But I think right now, if you're depending on the school to determine your close contact, you are living in a false narrative. Because right now, my daughter's been a close contact twice outside of school. 
and I've never been contacted by a contact tracer. I would only know that because my daughter is old enough to tell me, hey, so-and-so has it. I was certainly unmasked with her for a long period of time, so on and so forth. I'm a close contact. Currently, I'm a close contact also to for my son's my, my son's interaction at school as well. It is there, the contact tracing that's happening outside of school, especially with the ability of having these rapid tests, is not going to the local nurses or to Maven or to any of that thing. The amount of cases that are out there for us to say, hey, you know what? We're telling you this so that you can take greater precaution. We're missing so many that I think we're giving people false sense of security. And, and, and I'm in a much different spot when I was in the here and I said, I am in contact with the contact tracers. I knew where all the cases were. That was a different time during this pandemic where we knew the cases in the community were, we knew who the positives were, we knew the connections to the schools were. And I could sit in this meeting and I could say, those were, especially this meeting, I could say, those were UMass students, there's no connection to the school, there's nothing to be worried about. I can't do that through contact tracing right now. The, the idea of this, so to hold on to that, is I think you're gonna be wasting resources for the school that should be put on, you know, we're gonna do active testing and active monitoring and looking for symptomatic students. Cause that's what we do right now with everybody's vaccinated. And to, and to talk about what people said before that, you know, the Omicron virus very clearly goes, is not discriminatory to vaccinated and unvaccinated. So any child who is a close contact comes to school until they have symptoms. So, I, you know, what we, I mean, but now, so what are we saying by saying that you're a close contact, that I'm gonna look for symptoms more now? I think we're, anytime one of us has a runny nose or a cough now, what's the first thing that goes to your mind? Do I have COVID? Right? I mean, I mean, that's I think that's I think that's the I think it's a reasonable reaction that the community has at this point in the pandemic. Um, just a clarification that was said earlier, we are not starting this until the seventh. So the following next Monday is you know just you were saying in three or four days. We are starting on the seventh. Okay, so um so we're waiting to get the tests in district wide. Right now, Sunderland is in a, in a tight spot where we have to get the numbers of what the students' numbers, and we already ordered, we we're able to order, we ordered for the teachers, they let us kind of guesstimate, okay? So we guessed everybody. Um, and for the students, we have to give them a number by Friday in order to get into the queue, okay? And so we're already kind of in a spot. I was in a spot also if we decided to go not accept this, that we would tell the state, and say, you know, you really didn't give us enough time. Sorry, do you want the test back kind of deal. Um, so just kind of, you know, logistic-wise where things are at. So it is a whole nother week that um, it was two weeks when we decided to do this that we had until knowing that the numbers are coming down. They're going to be even lower hopefully next week. Um, and again, those numbers aren't real numbers either because the amount of home testing is taking place. So if we have, you know, I just looked on the thing, if there's 63,000 students with COVID in Massachusetts, K to 12 right now, okay? 0.2, are hospitalized. So that means you have 99.98% hospitalization rate. I mean, I mean, that is not, I mean, you have a higher probably flu rate based on that kind of thing. It's not affecting our population that we're serving at the level where and we know this now you know, with the data that we have and that people have the opportunity to vaccinate. So I think we need to make choices that are, that now we've got to start looking at mental health of students. We've got to look at other things that are affecting students, and that's what the nurses need to start doing. Um, so I don't know if, you know, Jessica, you're talking about doing, waiting just another week. Um, we may already be a week behind trying to get enough signed up to actually have, a, to have enough to go through. But um, the other districts are, are signing up and ready to go. Um, like I said, my I'm the one who's pushing this forward, so clearly you know where I stand on it. Okay. I thought this new program was starting this coming Monday. It's it's a week later. We don't have the student tests. They're going to arrive next probably next Wednesday or Thursday. Okay. Um. So the new protocol doesn't start for another week. It, our current protocol will still be in effect when this committee meets next Tuesday. Correct. But we um, need to know the reason why, was, I believe the reason why this meeting is happening now is that we need to know whether to open up this to the community. Right? So I need to, you know, there was, what was the, 
the committee wanted to meet to discuss my decision to move this forward. So is it moving forward? You know, um, and, you know, I went ahead and ordered the test because I leaned toward the fact where you talked to me, Jessica, about saying that, you know, you're against the program, you're against, you know, you want to get not stop contact tracing. So I understood that. So I took a, you know, a, a, I don't want to say it's a risk. So I have to return the stuff to the state. They're going to probably say send it to another school and not replace it. So I'm not, I wasn't overly worried about that. But at the same time, I can't communicate with parents when the school committees are, when the school committees decide to discuss the issue. And so, and then put you guys in an awkward spot that it's already been, you know, decided to the community. So that's why we're in that holding pattern. The, or, the order does have to be in by close of business for student tests in order to start um, on schedule with the other schools. The week of the seventh. Okay, so the timing of this actually can completely change my motion. Um, I, I'm. I can I could withdraw my motion completely, proceed as you've set us up to do with the new plan, but just ask, could we please have a report next Tuesday that gives us a better picture of how Omicron behaves in our schools? I, so I'm just gonna clarify, I, I can't speak to what Omicron does because we can't, we, I don't have that data, right? I can speak to what we're seeing in cases in our school. Yes, that's what I mean. Okay. Just yes. to be clear, is, I, I've actually seen a lot of data, data anywhere. The there is no aggregated data anywhere. There yeah. never has been. Desi has turned away superintendents who say, hey, I want to report in school transition. And Desi said, no, we don't have a place for you to submit that information. You know, the Framingham superintendent went to the media about it. So that, that information is not being collected. But moving to get rid of this tool that we've been using for so long, without knowing anything about how Omicron works in our schools just seems really reckless to me. I'd like us to have whatever information we can gather. Okay, hey, wait, uh, just from the Board of Health, <laughs> the first thing we need to say is these aren't DNA tested tests. We don't know it's the Omicron variant. So we're just going to say transmission of the COVID virus. I, I just, I have to be accurate. Thank you. And second, I think we need to just bring it down a notch with getting rid of they're they're not saying getting rid of the contact tracing what they're basically saying is assume everybody is a close contact in other words it's 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 actually raising it up a notch and saying you're all close contacts there is always a positive kid walking around the school sneezing all over everybody just assume it your kid is being snotted on. That's it, by a positive kid every day. And that's the assumption, and go with it. That's what the new program is. Every kid in school is a close contact. And I think that, and I, I think honestly, for our resources, now that I have fully listened for an hour, a little less, I think for resource purposes, the Board of Health would support that. And just for people watching, we're including everybody's at close contact, but we're now increasing testing, the opportunity to test. That's the other important part is that people have to sign up for the testing as well. You know, they have to sign, well, they have to opt in to, to get the test at home, which means you don't, this is for people watching. Um, you know, they have to opt in for the, the at-home test where they get one test a week for each child. Um, and then you can also do pool testing. So you can pool test on Monday, take the second test on Thursday. So basically you're, you're being able to be screened twice a week. Um, you know, and it, and it is adjusting to where we are within within COVID in the sense of it, if it being out there being more prevalent. And from a public health standpoint, I know no one else here has mentioned this because it's a touchy subject and I understand this, but why anyone isn't mentioning everybody here should be vaccinated, every child in school should be vaccinated. We have had two deaths in Sunderland in the last two weeks, and one of them was a 30-year-old, one of them was a 68-year-old, and neither of them were vaccinated. And so I understand people have legitimate personal reasons, religious reasons, health reasons, but vaccinations save lives and keep people out of the hospital, children and adults. 
So if you want, the contact tracing is like the least of our worries. It's vaccinations, testing, and watching where you're going and keeping your masks on. Now that's the public health. I'm, I'm a public health official and I was invited. I'm giving the public health speech, sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. Peter? Um, thanks, Meg, for all the things you were saying. Um, thanks, as usual, for the people that come to these meetings and speak up in the public comment we get, because uh, it all adds, it, I, I, I read it all or listen to it all, and it all makes me think about, you know, what the right way forward is. Um, in this case, it seems to me that uh, I certainly have more concern that we are falling short and probably falling well short on the normal sort of nursing things that we should be and would be getting done in a, in a normal year in terms of the variety of kids that need the nursing services that are provided at the school. And, and, and that's a it's an important part of, of school that probably wasn't the case when I was going to school, but it certainly is the case these days. And if we are um, spending a, a very significant part of our nursing resources on the contact tracing that appears uh, to make at best a very small difference in, in outcomes, then I think, you know, we, we, we need to take that into account so that um, I think, in my own view is that this is an issue that i mean i could say i don't feel strongly that this is something about that you know the administration should handle or we should step in on or something but i think that my view is that as a school committee member i think that what the administration is doing in this regard is the correct thing um i would be happy to vote on a, the motion on this i'd be happy just to you know, if Jessica chose to withdraw the motion and we just move on and let the administration uh, continue to do uh, the really good work that they've been doing throughout this whole thing. Um, and and uh, that's where I feel listening to all this. I'll withdraw my motion, but I would still like more information next Tuesday, please. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a reasonable request, realizing that only you know, there are limits on what may be possible to conclude. And sometimes you can get numbers and so on, and yet you really can't draw any conclusions. Um, oh, yeah. Correlation is it, not causation. When those close contacts go positive, we don't, we won't know if they caught it in school. We won't know if they didn't. But yeah. some information is better than no information. Yeah. But anyway, if Especially you... Especially using really misleading numbers. Yeah. Anyway, if you want to withdraw the motion, I'll withdraw the second. And that would keep it clean. As long as we can still get information next Tuesday, I withdraw my motion. You and I can talk uh, tomorrow or Friday and um, make sure I'm clear on exactly what you're asking. Um, and I, to the best of the data we have, I will provide what I can do to answer those questions. Outstanding. I didn't know, Greg, I didn't know if Megan or Keith wanted to add anything. Yeah, exactly. Any, any other uh, comments? Uh, I'm not seeing. Okay. Uh, uh, I, 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 I went and spoke to the nurses that I work with, and they're pretty unequivocal that this is the direction that we should move in. The, the, the amount of time and effort that they were putting in was not yielding anything that they could find useful. Um, and then throughout the last year and a half, I, you know, I have my opinions and beliefs, but I've, I've trusted the, the guidance of administration and the medical professionals. And then this is another situation where I would, um, I would do that as well. I think that we've been served very well. I appreciate everybody's uh, opinion and ideas, and, and I appreciate Jessica asking for more data. There's, it, it's always good to have more data, but at this point, I'm, I'm inclined to, to trust the, uh, the, the direction the administration wants to go in. I might just add also that I, I echo everything that's been said. I feel like there's a lot of information. It's it's good for me to hear from from Meg and Caitlin and 
Jessica, as always, I really appreciate your in-depth observation and interest in those numbers. I think data is important, but I hate to see the, <clears throat> I mean, it's important for me to hear all that information and to make these good decisions. But if we are, if our practices are yielding safe results, then I'd like to see the staff be able to put their attention into other places for the kids also. I really appreciate hearing from all of you guys. I totally agree with that. I want our staff putting their attention where it should be, but I feel like we just don't know yet if we are safe in this in this current wave. That's all I want to know. Indeed. All right, Peter. Just a procedure question. Um, I'm assuming that at this that that since there was no vote on listed on the agenda, that there's no need to take a vote. That uh, in the absence of a vote saying no, the administration will continue. Uh, proceeding, uh, you know, as as efficiently and quickly as they can to put the new system into work. Is that enough? Just like uh, the, the other three towns, essentially, we're leaving for now. We're leaving this in the hands of the administration. And I would say that I don't. Uh, you know, I I think that I, I've got nothing against having this special meeting because I think that uh, throughout this this whole process going on two years now. Uh, we've had a number of additional meetings, but it's important uh, both that we listen to the people that want to come and, and express their opinions at our meetings, and also that we have open discussions with the administration about how we are dealing with this. And I think today has been another good example of, of what we are supposed to be doing. Uh, and again, it's a real pleasure to have such a, uh, a competent group running the the whole school system uh and that especially includes our nurses and um so if i think of anything about all this it just highlights to me how important they are in in the effect in the good running of our school thank you thank you peter all right then i, I guess that maybe brings us to uh, a motion to adjourn unless anyone has anything else to add so moved Peter, outstanding. Uh, Jessica, yes. Keith, yes. Peter, yes. Megan, yes. Greg, yes. Thank you all so very much, and we are adjourned. Thanks for the discussion, everyone.